Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by Loserport.com. This is episode 44 and as ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeu. On this edition, I'll be looking back at the disappointing defeat up at Anfield. It was a battering, wasn't it? Um, Arsenal put to the sword by league leaders Liverpool um, and our defensive fragilities were once again exposed. I mean, what can I say? That was a defensive horror show from the Arsenal. Um, I didn't expect us to get anything from Anfield, in truth. Um, I I always felt that we were going to go up there and get beat. Um, And it was kind of a case of how many, wasn't it? And that's not how we should be thinking as Arsenal fans. The fact that we go into this type of fixture so worried and so resigned to defeat before the game even takes place just says a lot about how far we've fallen in the past couple of years or so. So for me... You know, like I said, I felt that Arsenal were always going to get beat up at Anfield, but I wanted to see a performance. I wanted to see a valiant effort. I wanted to see Arsenal go there, be difficult to break down, difficult to beat, and, and look to hit Liverpool on the counter attack. You know, we know Aubameyang can score goals. We know Lacazette can score goals. Um, you know, we know Aaron Ramsey can break into the penalty area late on and cause teams problems. So we know we've got that stuff in our locker. I just wanted to see Arsenal defend properly. Is that too much to ask? And I know we've got lots of injuries, but the basic concepts of defending seem to have gone out of the window. Um, And and this is not just under Unai Emery. You know, we were seeing these problems under Arsene too. I just hoped that maybe Unai Emery would find a way of resolving this type of thing. Unfortunately, up until now, he hasn't. And we always start by looking at the uh, initial team selected by Unai Emery, so that's what we're going to do again. Um, Bernd Leno was in goal. There was a back four of Stefan Licksteiner, Socrates, Skodran Mustafi and Sead Kalasinac. A midfield of Granit Xhaka, Lucas Torreira and uh, Aaron Ramsey with Alex Iwobi on the left, Ainsley Maitland-Niles on the right and Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang through the middle. Um, not too many complaints about the initial selection. You know, I don't think there was anything wrong with that. Um, I have, I'm someone that's been calling out for the return to a back four. And that's not because I feel we're more solid playing that way. But it's just because I don't feel that right now we have enough competent central defenders to play that way. And, and Lauren Koscielny, for me, is way off the pace at the moment. He's not ready to play regularly for Arsenal just yet. And so that meant we only had Shkodran Mustafi and Socrates available. And, and so the back four made sense. I'm not going to get on Unai Emery's back for that because it's something that initially I actually agreed with. Um, then, of course, the other surprise thing was Ainsley Maitland-Niles uh, playing on the right-hand side. And we've always talked about Ainsley Maitland-Niles not being a fullback, and I think that's absolutely right. But it, uh, it kind of shocked me to see him deployed on the right sort of wing uh, on Saturday because... That's not something we've ever seen Unai Emery do before. So it was a bit out of the blue. Um, Ainsley Maitland-Niles did score the goal. You know, he had energy in the first half. He was getting up and down. He was making the right runs. Maybe some question marks over whether he was helping Stefan Licksteiner enough defensively. Um, That is a criticism that you could perhaps throw at him after Saturday's game. But for me, he'd done okay. Um, You know, just okay. He wasn't brilliant uh, and he wasn't awful. So... Yeah, uh, that was the other selection choice, wasn't it? That kind of raised a few eyebrows. Um, You know, he could have gone maybe with uh, Aubameyang um, and Lacazette up top instead um, and maybe seen how that panned out. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, But Unai Emery had his reasons. He picked the team and and at kickoff, I wasn't overly disappointed with the team he'd selected. I didn't really have any major objections to it. So I'm not going to sit here now. after the game's passed and, and criticise him for that. Now, starting off um, right at the beginning of the game, you know, Arsenal played uh, OK. The first few minutes, Liverpool had quite a bit of possession. They were trying to impose themselves on us and it didn't really happen. Fabinho was giving the ball away quite a bit in the centre of midfield, as was Lucas Torreira um, and Granit Xhaka, if I'm being honest. It was a bit of a sloppy start to the game. And then, uh, obviously, Ainsley Maitland-Niles popped up Uh, On the 11th minute, great work from Iwobi and Ramsey. Ramsey pulled out to the left-hand side. Uh, They combined really well, the two of them. Uh, Iwobi broke free and delivered a fantastic ball into the path of Ainsley Maitland-Niles. And it was one of those balls that had the right weight on it, the right spin on it. Um, And it was 
a, a, such a pass that Allison couldn't really come out and commit himself to get it. It was kind of in no man's land, wasn't it? And it's one of those ones that sort of teases the goalkeeper, but he didn't come. Um, and fortunately for us, Ainsley Maitland-Niles was able to get there on the stretch and turn it in. And our Arsenal took the lead. And you're thinking, great, you know, what a fantastic start. 1-0 up at Anfield. What more do you want? Um, we're not stupid, are we? We didn't really think that we were going to go the remainder of the game without conceding. But it was a brilliant start, wasn't it? It was positive, And you would have thought that that would have breathed confidence into the Arsenal team. Um, but that lead was only to last for three minutes because on the 14th minute, uh, Liverpool drew themselves level. And it was a really, really poor goal to concede, wasn't it? I think Mo Salah was running in towards the penalty area. And Granit Xhaka managed to get back and made a fantastic tackle. Um, and at that point, because um, I was actually commentating on the game, at that point, you know, I kind of calmed down. I thought that Granite Xhaka had made the challenge and that the danger would now easily be swept away by either like Licksteiner or Mustafi. Unfortunately for us, though, Licksteiner's clearance um, or attempt at a clearance was a poor one, wasn't it? He kicked it straight at Mustafi. Um, the ball deflected into the path of Firmino. Bern Leno had already committed himself and Firmino uh, to take the piss, basically looked away when he finished that. That's how easy it was, you know, a couple of yards out from goal. All he had to do was tap it in and, and it was a cheap, cheap equaliser um, from an Arsenal perspective. And that was really, really disappointing having um, started the game pretty well and having got ourselves in front. And then again, you know, another piece of slack play in the middle of the park. This time it was Lucas Torreira. And Lucas Torreira for me looks absolutely knackered. I don't know what you guys think. I think he looks shattered I think he's played way too much football um, and that's as a result of us not having anyone else like him anyone else in his mold Unai Emery feels that he has to be in the team uh, more often than not and and we've seen um, you know a bit of fatigue creeping in there now with the Uruguay and I think I think that's fair to say um, but anyway he, he received the ball he seemed to turn into trouble didn't he turned into Sadio Mane and then Roberto Firmino picked up the ball literally um danced his way through the Arsenal defence. I think he went to the right of, of Mustafi, to the left of Socrates. And it all opened up for him, didn't it? Like the Red Sea, everybody committed themselves. It was poor, poor defending. Um, and he guided the ball into that bottom corner with his left foot. Brilliant finish from Firmino, it's got to be said. And, and that's the difference, isn't it? When a top team get these opportunities, they take them, they put you to the sword and they make you pay for them. We were unable to do that because we did have a little bit of a spell just before we scored. Um... We had a couple of uh, instances where we managed to get the ball in the box. There was one Mustafi threw himself at. The flag went up um, in the end, but I think that was for Aubameyang because Mustafi certainly wasn't offside, so I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Um, and then from then on in, you know, Arsenal heads dropped and Lichsteiner was being exposed at every opportunity. Kalasinac was being caught too high up the field. Um Socrates and Mustafi between them there was absolutely zero communication and uh, Liverpool got themselves a corner which came from basically a shit back pass from Ser Kalasinac it was a shit back pass to Bern Leno he in his efforts to try and keep the ball in ended up conceding a corner Pro no fault of his own um, you know Kalasinac's pass has to be better um, and from that corner uh, Liverpool put the ball in the box. Trent Alexander-Arnold took it, if I remember correctly. It was headed away by Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang or cleared away up the field. And Arsenal had the opportunity to push up and get out. Um, but Robertson picked the ball up on the halfway line, looked up and played a diagonal pass into the direction of Mo Salah, um, sort of just inside our penalty area. And it astonishes me at how easily he was allowed to uh, not not to pick out the pass because you you don't expect him to do that from um, where he is and uh, you know when your opponent's got the ball just inside their own half you're not overly worried about that but the fact that Mo Salah was left completely unattended um, and able to wriggle free you know you can't allow players of that quality that sort of space that sort of time and Mo Salah with one touch just guided it into the path. Of, of Sadio Mane and he just put it into the roof of the net free one um, and game over as far as I'm concerned you know people will say it wasn't over at that point but for me it was Arsenal dropped their heads having taken the lead um, and been on cloud nine for just three minutes we now found ourselves staring down the barrel of, of a defeat and for me that's really difficult to recover from isn't it and you know it's schoolboy defending 
once again. And, you know, I'll come on to talk about my thoughts overall on Arsenal's defending in a minute. But in terms of this game, um, it was like watching an, an Arsene Wenger team of, of the last two or three seasons, wasn't it? Away to a big team and, and completely capitulating. And then, of course, right on the strokers of half time, as just in case you had any hope of Arsenal fighting their way back into this one, um, Liverpool were awarded a penalty. Socrates with a foul on Mo Salah. A lot of people were uh, talking about it being a soft penalty. Mo Salah dived the week before, didn't he? Uh, or on Boxing Day, I should say, against Newcastle. So, um, you know, I must admit, when I first saw it, I thought there's probably minimal contact here, and Mo Salah's thrown himself down to the deck and, and he's managed to get a penalty and uh, whilst I do think that there's an argument it was a little bit soft I do think it was a penalty I'm being honest now you know um, and, and taking my Arsenal cap off for a minute you have to say that Socrates has fouled him and it's a silly silly foul because once Mo Salah gets the wrong side of you if you watch it again Socrates has a first little niggle at him and you think right he's got away with that now you need to tread carefully the angles against Salah isn't it you know um, he, he he likes to approach the goal from that angle. Um, and I just think that if you're a good goalkeeper and you close out your angles and you get your angles right, then you should be OK there. And, you know, he's he's managed to get the wrong side. Socrates had the first niggle. Then he has the second niggle. And it's the second niggle that gives Michael Oliver no choice but to point to the spot. Um, you know, it's probably one of those ones where I'd say it was 70% penalty, maybe 30% not. But... You're away at Anfield. What do you expect? What do you expect the referee to do? Um, you know, that's the way football is, whether it's right or wrong. And there's no VAR in the Premier League at the moment. So, you know, referees are influenced by things like that, um, by your movement, by the player who's hit the ground's movement, by the home crowd. Um, so, unfortunately, that's just the way things are. And, you know, didn't expect anything different at Anfield. And I, I don't know why anyone else did, if I'm honest. Um, then, of course, half-time came and um, it, Lauren Koscielny came on, didn't he? Um, which I thought didn't really make any sense. I was thinking, you know, is, is Koscielny coming on and we're switching to a back three so we can push our wing-backs further up the field? But no, that wasn't the case. It was a straight swap for Skodran Mustafi. I don't know if Unai Emery was looking to protect him um, given that he's been out for a few weeks. So anyway, um, you know, it doesn't really matter now, does it? It was a dead substitution that had zero impact on the game. Um, and none of them did, did they? Alexander Lacazette came on on the 71st minute for a Bamiyang straight swap. Um, Lacazette probably should have had a penalty, um, but it was 5-1 at the time. I'm not going to kick up a massive stink about it. Um, the bottom of his foot was kicked and uh, he went down. Um, but, I, I, you know, the thing is, Arsenal were deflated at the time the game was done and dusted but I still want to see Arsenal players appeal make a fuss of it put the referee under pressure give him a decision to make and our players didn't really do that it was like they were disinterested and in truth their heads dropped at 3-1 and you know at that point in the game I I guess I could see why um, it just felt like a, a waste of time and a waste of breath I think it was around about with 25 minutes to go when Liverpool were awarded their second uh, penalty of the evening, which subsequently led to their fifth goal of the game. Firmino took it and being on a hat-trick, it made sense, didn't it? Um, ball came into the box. Dejan Lovren um, went down like a sack of potatoes under the challenge of Sead Kolasinac. But you've got to say it's stupid on Kolasinac's part. It's so stupid, you know, to to push someone in the back as obviously and as forcefully as he did. You, you're just asking for trouble, and I don't get why players do that. I, I don't understand it. What went through his head at that moment in time that he felt he needed to shove uh, Dejan Lovren the way he did? I know he went down easily, but players will do that to get the attention of the referee. How many times have we seen players stay on their feet and not get their decision one example that sticks in my mind was a Raheem Sterling one against Spurs. I think it was not last season, the season before maybe, where he was shoved in the back. He stayed on his feet. He didn't get the decision. So you can't be surprised when players throw themselves down. My question is, forget looking at the referee. Forget looking at our opponent's behavior. Let's look at what we could have done to prevent that. And Sead Kolasinac was stupid there. It was plain stupid, wasn't it? There's nothing else to add to that. It was just silly. Um you know, a, a lack of common sense, um, you know, maybe a, 
a sign of frustration. I don't know. But for me, you know, you can't have players doing that. And it doesn't matter if it's 4-1 at the time. It's, it's There's no need for it. Um, it shouldn't be happening. And, you know, Arsenal, for me, just completely dropped their heads after the third goal. And from then on, you know, I, I was looking at the clock, waiting for it to finish. Joining me on the line to continue reflecting on that disappointing defeat is Mike Stavru. Mike, welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna. How you doing, mate? Uh, not too good, Harry. As, as you can imagine, it's been a stressful past 24 hours. You know, loads of stick from plenty of people, but um, I'm just making myself a roast dinner. So hopefully, them potatoes can make me feel better. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't had my dinner yet. I'm a, I'm. A, I think it's in progress. I hope anyway. If not, I better give the wife a call. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um. So, Mike, your thoughts on on yesterday's game? Um. I've already spoken a little bit earlier on in the show about sort of my initial reaction to the team selection and, and the yeah. way things unfolded, um, your initial thoughts and, and how did you think that it went overall? Yeah, just utterly shambolic. I mean, there's not much else you can say, is it? I think just from the offset, uh, the, the wrong, the wrong, um, the wrong lineup as uh what well, I, I read it. I'm not sure, but I saw it as a, as a four, two, three, one, I think with, um, with Lich Steiner, and Klasnach is traditional fullbacks. Yeah. And then AZ making Niles as a right mid is how you saw it as well. Well, I, I was a bit confused, actually, because obviously, um, as you know, I was recording a commentary on the game um, up yeah. at Anfield. And I got given a team sheet. And uh, what it said on the team sheet compared to what the Premier League's official, um, you know, the Premier League's official pictures um, when yeah. they show the lineups on the screen, it was completely different. They had made Niles as part of a front three. Um, so I was a little bit confused as what was right and what was wrong. And I thought, let me wait till the game starts and, and try and suss this out. But yeah, I think what you're saying makes sense. It looked like a, a 4-2-3-1. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Looking at it. Yeah, I mean, just just the wrong, not even just formation, hey, but the wrong mentality. Like to go toe-to-toe with Liverpool is just bizarre. And it's not really something that we'd associate with Emery. Like we see him as quite tactically flexible. And he's quite malleable with his with his uh, tactics. So you, you'd think like after a big win against Spurs, where we showed you know we can go toe to toe with um with, with a, a big team, why would he you know go with such a gun ho approach? You'd think you know away at Anfield, one of the most dangerous places to go these days, you'd have a more cautious ap- approach, and that kind of fed into the team, and the, the team just didn't really look like they knew what they were doing. Um, they they were outrun out all over the pitch. Um, you know, for some of the goals, it was just so simple, like the, the defensive errors, just like no communication. And I, I know that over you know our twenty two unbeat unbeaten run, there were some issues defensively. But from what I saw yesterday, it was a lot worse than that. And I think we've got we've got a long way to go. I mean, I don't I know that you were quite vocal, Harry, on Twitter, saying you know this is. A similar points tally to how it was last year. I think, you know, it's going to take a while and I think we need to have a bit more patience as fans because ultimately Emery's taken over, um, you know, a 10-year period of failure and that's what's been ingrained not only into the players but into the club. Um, and a lot of how we progress will be based on the investment that Emery receives and the backing. But to be honest with you, you know, I, I can't see that, can you? Do you know what? It's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I've taken an absolute battering on Twitter today. My notifications have been going off all day. Um, I've been accused of um, spreading toxicity amongst the Arsenal fan base um, j- just because people don't agree with me. And the, the yeah. thing with me is uh, I did pull up the point about the points tally. It's not all that different to that of last season. It's one point different, in fact, um, at the same stage in the season. Um, we have one more point this year than we did at the same point last year. So that that is worth looking at because at the end of the day, it's points that we play football to earn. It's points that get you into the top four. It's points that get you into the Champions League. Um, ultimately, that brings financial reward and you can go out and get the players that you need to try and improve this side. So I don't think that's irrelevant. Um, you know, that is something worth looking at. In terms of the initial lineup, I've already said earlier on in the show, I didn't take any issue with it. Um, before kickoff, and the, the reason for that is because in recent weeks I've been quite vocal about the fact that 
I didn't like us playing a back three when we didn't even have two fit centre-halves. I thought that was stupid. I thought we were putting square pegs in round holes or whatever the saying is and, and just trying to get by it. And when we'd played most of the season with a back four and I just couldn't understand why we didn't switch back to that and try and, and build from there and, and get sort of steady the ship and get back on track until... Um, we had those players fit again and maybe Emery wants to play with a back three going forward that's fine but at that point in time and on Saturday we didn't have the personnel to do that so I take no issue with that where I do take issue is you know people talking about Unai Emery needs three transfer windows he needs four transfer windows I get that in the overall grand scheme of things Unai Emery needs a lot longer a lot more time but what you also have to take into account is that team that took to the field on Saturday against Liverpool, if you look at the back five, and I'm talking about the four defenders and the goalkeeper, three of them were signed post Arsene Wenger. Okay, that's Stefan Lichsteiner, Socrates and Bernd Leno. Now, people have been talking about how Socrates isn't good enough, how Lichsteiner isn't good enough, how Leno isn't good enough. Well, who's responsible for those signings? It might not be Unai Emery, but then it's certainly Sven Mislintat because... Those players have been brought in post the Arsene Wenger era. We can't keep blaming their faults on Arsene Wenger. Arsene Wenger's gone. Forget about it. He's done and dusted. Now yeah. it's time to look forward. Those three players are not Wenger players. They are the post yeah, Arsene Wenger. Much, Go on. Harry, how, how much input does Emery actually have? I'm, I'm not sure about that. I reckon he puts together a list of players that he might want. Um, but we know that Sven Mislintat has been, you know, basically very involved in the recruitment along with uh, with, uh, the other guy's name I can't pronounce, Raul. San Lee, yeah. Yeah, he, him and Mislintat have been very in in that. I completely agree. I completely agree with that, but I have, that's what I'm saying. I don't know who the fault lies with. Is it with Unai Emery or is it with Sven Mislintat? But it lies with somebody because we've brought three defensive players in and none of them are good enough. Yeah, I mean, ultimately as well, it's the ambition of the of the club. I mean, if you're giving, like, say it is Emery, just for example, if if you're saying to him, look, uh, you need to go out and get free players and you've only got a budget of, like, 60, 70 million, however much we spent, for, like, three players, I mean, you're not going to get the, 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 the good, the top quality that's good enough to to challenge, are you? I mean, we I, we got kind of lucky with Lucas Serrero that he is a really, like, good pick and he's only 22, and we we've been we have been lucky that he's been incredible, but it's it's not always going to work out like that. And when you like with, with Stefan Lichsteiner, he he's a free. Like, what do you expect? He's a he's an experienced head. He probably wasn't even expected to be starting, but because of like our injuries, he he's had to play. Socrates, I think, is is a good defender. Um, but you know, when you're in a in a back three like we played yesterday, or back sorry back two. He's gonna he's gonna look bad, isn't he? Ultimately, and he he has had good games. This, you know, at the end of the day, Harry, it's about the ambition of not just the manager. It's about the ambition of the club and where, where they want to go. Because you, you you can like draw comparisons with with Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool because he was brought in, didn't particularly do well in his first season. I think he finished eighth. Um, but you could see that he was trying to build something and he was you know implementing his tactics and I think you know Emery's done that to an extent you know playing out the back um a high press um not necessarily going to work every time but it does take a lot of time to fine tune that the, the only difference is with, with us in Liverpool is that they've they've backed him so let, let's see what happens I mean obviously it's devastating to get smacked and we're, we're too used to it um I'm going to bring up my stats here which I know you love but um We've conceded four goals in the first half of a Premier League game for the fourth time. That's the first half, one half. Yeah. With Liverpool obviously yeah. responsible for two of those uh, back in 2014. I mean, that's just not good enough, is it? No, it's not. It's, it's awful. And, you know, I get what you're saying in, in comparison between sort of Jurgen Klopp and Unai Emery. For me, the Liverpool fans bought into the Jurgen Klopp thing because they saw uh, a progress. They saw the vision of Jurgen Klopp. My issue is at the moment that I'm struggling to see what Unai Emery's vision is. There's this thing about playing out from the back. Well, all that seems to be happening at the moment is Arsenal putting themselves under unnecessary pressure on the edge of their own penalty area, inviting an opponent on when you don't have the players to play that way, 
to me makes no sense. Um, but it has improved since the beginning, Harry. You've you got to say it, it has. Ha- it has improved, Mike. It has. But you know, often as well, how many times do you watch Arsenal now, and most of our possession is amongst our back four? We don't seem to know how to transition from that playing out of the back into creating play and building play, and that's. That's my thing. It just it seems boring to me. It seems negative. I... Would well, you know how you build play? But by playing creative players, and our three hundred and fifty grand a week player has been isolated. I said this to you as well on on the Arsenal fan show on, on Love Sport a few weeks ago, and you and Dave both disagreed with me. And I, I said that Emery doesn't fancy Ozil, and I, I think it's clear to us all now that he, that he doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I hold my hands up at the time. You know, I was kind of annoyed by people going on about this fallout that we'd we'd had no proof of. It was just speculation. It was just hearsay. But as things have developed, you know, we're starting to see that it probably is something to do with the fact that Unai Emery doesn't fancy him. And for me, that's not good enough. You know, you, what I wanted to see when we appointed a manager this summer was I wanted to see a manager come in um, who was tactically able tactically flexible I think that's the word someone who would come in yeah. and adapt the team from game to game depending on our opponent understand our weaknesses try to um, compensate for those in other ways and at the beginning of the season Unai Emery was doing that you've got to say and I praised him at the beginning of the season and I was praising him for weeks and weeks and weeks and throughout that unbeaten run it wasn't always great um, I was the first one to say, you know, we were lucky during certain games uh, and yeah. we didn't really play particularly well. But he just seems to have lost his way in recent weeks for me. And, uh, you know, I, as soon as I say that, I get people on my back. You know, how can you criticise a manager so early in his tenure? Well, you know, I don't see why as a fan, as a paying supporter of the club, I shouldn't be allowed to voice my concerns. I'm not turning up to grounds and telling the players to F off and telling them to get out of our club and they're not good enough and or even calling for Unai Emery's head. I'm just saying that I would have liked to have seen a little bit more progress than what we have seen, particularly in the defensive phase. There has been zilch improvement in our defence and I can't see how anybody can deny that. Yeah, I mean, the defence is, as I said, shambolic. And we've seen minor improvements, but not in terms of improving individuals because you can't really do that. But as as a system, like I do go back to the Spurs game and I thought how we defended from the front, like all 11 players, like this is the kind of direction that we need to go. But again, that was at home and that's not always going to work. You need to kind of tailor it to the exact team that you're playing and the kind of tactics that, that they will put out but as I said Harry you know I don't think it's it's the players that he wants there's a lot of deadwood in, in that team I mean like just look at the kind of centre backs that we have um, Laurent Koscielny I think he's he's finished to be honest with you I think he's, his legs are gone yeah. um, Mustafi always got a mistake in him we, we've known this for a long time uh, Socrates you know I mean He's putting some good performances, as I said, but he's not the kind of centre back that is going to win you stuff. Like, let's let's be honest. No, that's right. Um, but Mike, let me put a question to you. Yeah, Arsene Wenger. Would you say Arsene Wenger didn't get the the amount of backing from the board that he should have during his time at Arsenal, towards the end in particular? Um, actually, towards the end, he kind of did get a, a bit of backing, but. I don't really know why. It, it was a bit bizarre because obviously we signed a Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang in January. A lot of that was off the back million. of sales though, wasn't it? Remember we sold Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain that year for £35 million. Yeah. So, but overall, would you say that Arsene Wenger had the backing that he deserved from the board? No, no way. No. no right. Not. So what makes people think, and this is a genuine question to you, what makes people think that this board will be any different when it comes to Unai Emery. Because that's where my concern comes from. My concern comes from the fact that we need players. We're shopping in Lidl. Not that there's anything wrong with that if you shop in Lidl. But <laughs> we're, shop- wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we're shopping in Lidl and Liverpool are shopping in Marks and Spencers. That's the difference at the moment. So yeah. what makes people yeah. think that Unai Emery will be backed more than Arsene Wenger was? That's what I, I really want to know. No, I mean... I- I probably have to agree with you, and based on on history, I, I'm I'm not sure we will. You know whether whether there's a slight change um, if Stan ever takes like a, a step back and his son comes through, 
uh, Josh. I'm not sure if that if, if that will happen, but um, what Unai Emery is going to have to do is what he did at, at Sevilla, working on a bit of a smaller budget and um, really like molding the players to his to his own system. And you, you're right. I mean, like based on what he's bought so far in Leno, uh, Socrates, Lichsteiner, Torreira is has been the only good signing out of that. But then again, you know, we, we go back to is it his decision? And it it is just based on you know where where the club and where where the ownership want want us to be. If they're if they're more than happy with us, you know, winning an FA Cup and um, yeah. finishing in Champions League places, then we're we're going about it the right way because we're not we're not too far away. But um, yeah, you know, I can't particularly see. It. I mean, I have to, I have to agree with you. I don't think I don't think the ambition's there, and it is it is shocking to not back your new manager. I mean, like, why would you? Uh, spend all that money that that we made from sales, as you said, fifty million on, on Lacazette and seventy million on Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. Why, why would you give that to a manager who, um, let, let's be honest, like they probably knew he was leaving at the end of that season? Yeah, no, that's right. And to me, there's there's just so many things that don't make sense. I think the problem comes from the top down. Um, this is not a call for Unai Emery to be sacked. Don't get take me the wrong way. I, all I'm saying is that I would have liked to have seen a manager come in and make us significantly better defensively, whether that's through signing players or whether that's through work on the training ground. And I have not seen that. We've seen him sign players. It's not really worked. Um, Matteo Guendouzi, you could argue, has been a decent signing. But for me, he's a youngster. He's not ready to boss Arsenal's midfield. And the fact that he's played so many games this season tells you where we are. Do you know? And and that leads me on to my next point, which is around the captaincy. Um, Aaron Ramsey was given the armband um, on Saturday. Aaron Ramsey, who's been frozen out of the team. Aaron Ramsey, who is not being offered a new contract. Aaron Ramsey, who in Unai Emery's eyes is not good enough to play week in, week out. Well, then why the bloody hell has he got the captain's armband? Why did Mesut Ozil have it the week before, having been dropped the week before that? It, it just makes no sense to me. There's so many things Unai Emery's doing at the moment that I can't make, um, I can't understand. I can't make out where where he's coming from um and again you know not calling for him to be sacked all i'm saying is i want to understand the thinking behind some of these decisions and i, I just can't get get my way to that point yeah i mean on the on the captaincy thing harry i don't really think it means anything in, in the modern game anymore you know there's not that kind of figure that, that you hold up and say well he's captain you know, we have stupid things like club captains now. I remember last season for Manchester United, it was Michael Carrick. The the bloke didn't even play. So, you know, it is it is one of these things where you, you, you question its importance. And I guess maybe Unai Emery is not really that bothered about it. He's more focused on stuff on the pitch. But this whole saga um, with Ramsey and Ozil, you know, it's a bloody mess, Harry. It's an absolute mess. And it's a mess left for Unai Emery to clean up that he didn't even create. Why would you give Mesut Ozil a 350 grand contract just to appease the fans? Because if we look at it, that's what it was. We, we were in January. Alexis Sanchez said, I've, I've had enough. I, I want out. And it looked like Mesut Ozil's contract was, was running out. So they, they just said, you know what? Screw it. We'll, ju- we'll just give him a contract for the sake of it. And it's actually screwed everything now because the, the knock-on effect of that has meant that Aaron Ramsey, whose deal is running out, he said, well, Mesut Ozil's on 300 grand a week and he's not even bloody playing. I want 250 grand. Whereas before, he probably would have said, you know what, I'll, I'll take 150, I'll take 180. So we're in, a, we're in a massive dilemma now. And I want to ask you, what do we do with Mesut Ozil if, if he's not going to play? He can't just sit on the bench. And who's going to pay his wages? He's already burned bridges in, in Germany, so he's not going back there. I yeah. can't see any of the Spanish teams going for him. Where's he going to go? Like a French league team, but who's going to pay his wages? It's this bizarre. Is, this is the thing, and, and Mesut Ozil's not an idiot, is he? He's not going to take a pay cut just because Unai Emery doesn't fancy him. He'll probably, you know, he's he's not at the beginning of his career, is he? He's probably achieved uh, the highest thing you can in football, which is lifting the World Cup with his country. He probably won't really give a shit if he doesn't play all that much um, and, and sort of collects that sort of wage packet. For me... Yes. You're stuck with Mesa Ozil, whether that's Unai Emery's fault, you know, is a different matter. It's definitely not his fault, by the way. Um, you know, whether it's Wenger's fault is is besides the point. The point of the matter is that we've got 
mess at Ozil at Arsenal Football Club. And I just think that given the amount we're pumping into his bank account every week play or him. every month, play him, play him, get the best out of him, get your money's worth from him. Yeah. Because for me, you know, you could argue that Mesut Ozil is not one of the top um, attacking midfielders in the league. You know, some people will say De Bruyne is better. Others will say Hazard, you know, and there's loads of players that you can look at and say, you know, they produce more and more regularly. But when you look at that Arsenal team, he's not worse than Mkhitaryan. He's not worse than Alex Iwobi, who, by the way, I thought played OK yesterday, I've got to say. Um, you know, that he's not worse than the other options available to us. So why... The only thing, Harry, is that you have to yeah. question what was his mental state now. He knows, all right, we don't know for, for sure, but he clearly knows if it is the case that he's not fancy. So is he going to is he going to turn up when he plays? Well, you know, you say that, but against Burnley, I, I thought he'd done okay, considering all that had gone on before that game. He came into the side... Um, it was a fantastic pass to Kalasinac, wasn't it, that opened Burnley up. I think that was for yeah, the first that's the goal. Thing. Against Burnley, we're talking about he's missed games like the, the North London derby. He's missed Liverpool, you know. If, yeah, but how, if can it, got, how can it get any play. worse than what we saw on Saturday? If Mesut Ozil was in the team, we still would have lost 5-1 yesterday. But he yeah. might have created another opportunity at 1-0 that put us 2-0 up. You know, it's, it's all ifs and buts. But what I'm trying to say is we're not any weaker uh, sorry, we're not any better for Mesut Ozil not being in the team. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree, and it's a it's it's a mess, and you know th this this needs to get sorted out quickly. Um, but you just think like, what what kind of precedent does it set when a, a player like that is left left on the bench? I think it's actually you know in in some ways it is a strong move by Unai Emery because you know he's come under flack for it. Yeah, looking beyond the, the Liverpool game, Harry, I think we have to kind of look into what, what Emery wants and ultimately he's going to have to make a decision whether he's going to put Ozil into, into the side or not. I think he he probably should, but as I said, there's no point trying to put him in the team if, if he doesn't fit your tactics, if he doesn't fit the, the, the style of play that you want. But I just think it's, it's an issue that needs to get sorted out Either we need to sell him in in January, um, or or play him. There's 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 no none of this in between. You know that that stuff that, that I read uh, the the day before the match. Um, there was an update from from Arsenal, an, an injury update. You know we have one every single week, yeah. uh, like a day before the game. And Özil wasn't included in that. And then about half an hour later, the, the story broke that that Özil wasn't in the squad for the Liverpool game. So number one, where's the leak in the club? Because yeah. obviously someone yeah. knows something. And number two, how is that getting out? This is not like this is not how it how it should work. Yeah, it's it's a mess, isn't it, with the whole Ozil situation? And yeah, it's it's really difficult to read that one. Um, Mike, just before I let you go, we've got a couple of questions come in. Um, yeah, I'm going to put a couple of them to you as well. Um, this one comes in from Mank Goonian, um, a listener of the show. So thanks for your support, mate. Um, he asks, in an ideal world not including under-21 players, how many of this squad would you actually keep? Just off the top of your head, quickly, who would you keep um, as a sort of core if you were revamping the whole entire Arsenal squad? Yeah, um, well, there's there's quite a few players that I would keep, Harry, to be honest, because I think that they can be improved. Um, out of the, the defence, Kolasinac, I think, has, has potential as more of a wing-back. Uh, Bellerin shown, impro shown improvement. Socrates... Rob Holding, Lucas Torreira, Granite Xhaka. Oh, hey, I'm gonna get. <laughs> sorry, I'm getting rid of him. Oh. <laughs> he's been alright, but he's 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 still not completely convinced me. Uh, from the midfield, I would keep as well, because um, I think as well on his on his day he'd be a good player if the whole contract situation is resolved. Um, and then Lacazette, Aubameyang. Um, to be honest, there's not many. There's there's not much more than that. Yeah. It won't be. I don't think it's good enough. Mkhitaryan, I don't think it's good enough. Yeah. Um, Mesut Ozil obviously do doesn't fit the style he wants to play, and he's and he's not worth worth the money we're paying him. So yeah, not not many to be honest. Not many. Not loads. Not many indeed. Right. The next question comes from Suburban Guna Chris. Um, he asks, how much money would it take, and the number of players to to get us where Liverpool are? So how how many how many players do oh. we need to bring in? Um, and how much money are we looking at? 
we need it's not just you know going shopping to to Marks and Spencer's Harry we need a banquet mate <laughs> we, we need we, we, we need the whole lot we need a hog roast we need a barbecue we need um so I would say at least two center backs a left back um two wingers um and to be honest if I'm if, if you're asking me in terms of challenging I think we need uh, a keeper better than Leno yeah so agreed. that's a lot I would say about I'd say about five, six first-team players at least. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd say six as well. And I think we need to spend at least £250 million oh. to get anywhere near oh, Liverpool's level at the moment. Um, you know, I, I mean, we're praising Liverpool, but they haven't won anything yet. That's, you know, that's... that's well, worth. I don't know, mate. Like, based on based on their performances recently, I, I'm quite worried. And actually, uh, I made a bet with, with a mate at work. If Liverpool do win the league, I've got to shave my beard off. So oh, God. I'm not very happy. Oh, God. There ain't I'm enough razors in the world, is there? <laughs> uh, I'm going to be looking like a 12-year-old, man. I, I, can't, I can't do it. <laughs> That's why I keep mine as well. Um, and also, Chris <laughs> asks, uh, how many transfer windows of doing that is realistic? I would say it's hard, isn't it? Because you want to say three or four, probably four, but then... It's who you lose in that time as well and, and who sort of gets past their peak. It's, it's difficult to answer that one. But really good question, Chris. Um, thank you for sending that one in. I've got one final one that I'm going to go through, just conscious of time. Don't want Mike's potatoes to burn in the oven as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard Wright says, um, I suspect that we will not spend big at all in January. Should we be looking at championship level players in January? trying to find a gem um, yeah yeah i think so i mean we've been linked with um norwich city's right back max Ahrens, who yeah. is 18 years old and there's no reason why, why we shouldn't there's plenty of good players in, in that league harry especially when you look like the style of football that um that leads playing at the moment with marcelo bielsa yeah they're, they're good players and it takes good players to play well in that system you've got um you've got harry wilson obviously you know who's who's uh, on loan um, for, from Liverpool. But um, there are plenty of good players. Uh, Kamar Roof is, is another one who's been linked to a move to the Premier League. Yep. Um, yep. I mean, not, not. I mean, definitely not as first-team players, let's be honest. But as squad players, why not? I mean, we need them. It's better. I'd rather have Max Ahrens and Stefan Lichsteiner, to be honest. Fair point, fair point. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure that I'd be raiding the Championship just yet. I don't think things have gotten that bad um, just yet. But... Um, Mike, thank you very much for your time. Thanks to all of you who sent in questions, comments, and, and of course, those of you who listen to us on a regular basis, please, please hit the subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. If you're listening on iTunes and please like, um, the video or the track as well, that really helps too. Um, thanks to Mike Stavery for joining me once again, and uh, we'll be back after the Fulham game. So until then, I uh, hope you all have a wonderful New Year's Eve. And uh, I'm sure you'll hear from a hang hungover Harry, I should say, um, following on from the Fulham game. So until then, guys, take care.